Well, I want to welcome everybody tonight. Uh, thanks for being here. This is Randy Brown. And tonight, we've got all things shooting. This is a webcast uh, that I'm uh, very familiar with doing. I really enjoy the interactive nature of being able to meet coaches online uh, to share information on the great game that we have here. And tonight, uh, we are going to uh, cover some great things. I want to Again, welcome all the first-time participants uh, of, our, of our webcast. Uh, we hope you become uh, loyal uh, participants and come often to the programs that we have because we have a bunch of them. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself for a second, but uh, you're in the right place. Uh, this is Randy Brown, Coach RB, and we are ready to roll. So I'm going to take you through this program. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, coaches, we we record everything, and the reason we do is is because we know some coaches just can't make it. So if you need to go back and watch something again, uh, kind of save it, then more power to you. Uh, enjoy watching it. So here's the, here's some of the things, uh, bullet points we're going to cover tonight. We're going to talk about what I call a secret, and that's the who, what, where, and how many. And I'm going to get into that in detail. I also want to show you a video or two of, of a shooting drill that, that I've gained so much from. And I think really, I mean, to me, it's the only shooting drill that you need. I'm going to talk about my time with Steve Kerr. And when I put this all together, actually started working on it, uh, Steve was not the buzz that he is today. And he certainly is. But I, I was very blessed in my coaching career to have worked with a lot of tremendous young guys, Steve being one of them in Arizona, 85 through 87. I'm going to share with you some, some download uh, uh, links. I have a, a ton of great resources for you I want you to take with you. And then also, uh, if you would, a uh, little bit later on in the program, I want you to uh, help me out uh, with a poll that will take us just a matter of seconds to fill out, and you'll be able to do it right on your computer screen there uh, because I'm embarking on a, a online coach certification uh, learning environment and what we're doing tonight is going to be one of just many many modules uh, that I'm going to uh, present to coaches around the world. Uh, I've been in touch with many coaches outside the states and I believe that now is the time uh, to uh, unleash this, and your help tonight in the poll will be huge uh, to give me some guidance on where to go with that in a little bit more specific way. I started coaching. For those of you that don't know, I know many of you are, are loyal uh, Coach RB supporters, been getting the newsletter, uh, been involved in some of our programs uh, for several years now. But those of you uh, that this is your first time, and don't know a lot about myself. Again, been very blessed. In 1979, I was a high school junior varsity coach over in eastern Iowa. And my goal was to become a, a Division I basketball coach. And because of guys like Lute Olson, uh, who I worked for right out of the chute as a graduate assistant at Arizona, and Tim Floyd, Kevin O'Neill, Larry Eustace, Gary Gardner, there's so many of them uh, that these guys really – uh, have shown me the way. And honestly, in my mentoring program, and I, I mentor coaches uh, all over the United States who are aspiring or current college coaches. And the reason I can do that is, number one, what I gained from all of these great coaches. And they were so giving of, uh, of themselves to teach me this profession and how to go about coaching and dealing with people in the right way. So I'm unbelievably indebted to those guys. And the second thing I did is I just decided after my coaching career ended at Iowa State that, you know, I have a lot to give. And it would be a shame if I didn't reach out and became an ambassador, if you would, for the game of basketball and to help coaches do what they love to do better. And that's really why I do what I do. That's what Coach RB is all about. And you can kind of see the extended network that I've been able to develop in the NBA and throughout college and high school. And those were some of my stops. I became a head Division I basketball coach and, and just 
all along the way. Worked with tremendous people. And I, I throw that out, not to toot my horn, but as you get Coach RB newsletters and join our programs and, and maybe decide to be mentored by me and in our programs, I think it's really important to know who I am, what I'm about, and the people that I've been around. Here's the shooting secret. I'm going to dive right into it. And we've got coaches signed up that are, that are on this program right now who uh, are, are better shooting instructors than I. They know more about, uh, about the art of shooting uh, than I'll probably ever know. I'm just going to share with you from my experience where I'm coming from on this uh, on the art of shooting because I definitely believe that you've got to develop a culture. We talk a lot about culture, program culture. You know how how we act, uh, what we do, what we stand for uh, in our high school basketball program or our college or, or NBA program, and it goes with business, obviously, not just sports. But I want to talk about the secret being developing a culture of shooting. It's all based around the fact that there are only so many possessions in a game. And it kills me when I watch a game and I know that those possessions are not being used efficiently. Because there's only so many of them. You know, you're going to have turnovers. Okay, You're, you're going to have some things happen. But those possessions that, that you truly have authority over, you know, you have to optimize those. And you as the coach, it's up to you to develop that culture. Well, what are we talking about? Shooting is not a right. And, you know, I should be giving this to parents, honestly, not coaches, because I'm telling uh, you guys and gals so many things that you already do and already believe in. But you know, for some reason in basketball, we have decided somewhere along the line that we, uh, excuse me, we have decided somewhere along the line that if I'm open and I'm on the floor, I shoot it because I'm playing basketball and the goal is to make baskets. Wrong. It's not a right just by being on the floor. Basketball has never been and will never be, unless we're talking about kindergarten or third grade or, or some level where it's just about the exposure. It'll never be an equal opportunity uh, adventure. It shouldn't. All right. Now, how do we deal with kids and parents in terms of shooting? All right. Well, my best advice is to appeal to their strengths as offensive players. It, when we start to limit kids by, you know, um, Tom, you're not a very good shooter, and so when you're in the game, I really don't want you to shoot. And that's really deflating to a kid. I'm a big proponent of taking a kid and developing his role in a very positive way. Now, by telling him he's good at certain things, you're basically telling him he's not very good at a bunch of other stuff. But let's, let's empower that young player, let's empower that college player to be good and bring value to his team based on what his strengths are. So I would tell a player, hey, you're good at finishing around the basket. You're good at getting it to the rim off the break. You're a good foul shooter. You're 70% foul shooter. I want you to get to the line. And I might stop right there. Okay, because I'm developing a culture through roles. I'm empowering players through their roles to understand since this is a team game. The last time I looked, it said our team versus theirs. Empower these young guys to value possessions. And by doing that, we're trying not to turn it over. We are trying to get fouled. And when we take a, a shot in a basketball game in the half court, we want it to be a good shot by the right person. And I'm going to get into that here in a second. So what do you need to do? You need to define. Have you ever told a kid, that's a bad shot? Have you ever defined what a bad shot is? Do they know for their teammate? For a player coming off the bench or for themselves, do they know what a bad shot is? If not, you've done a 
really a terrible job of coaching them and communicating because you must let them know. When we use terminology as coaches, that's a whole other program, coaches. But when we use terminology, we have to have already uh, introduced it, taught it, and emphasize it at all times if we're going to expect kids to respond positively to using words like a bad shot. All right. Bad shot is as good as a turnover, right? That's what they say. All right. I want to talk about who, what, where, and how many. Really getting into the specifics of, of uh, what I'm talking about here. All right. So let's break it down. Who? Who is the player taking the shot? Who are the players that should be taking the shots? Which players should be taking most of the shots? And my coaching friend, Tim Floyd, lives by a concept called 60 by 2. And I don't have to, uh, t tonight don't have the time to go into great detail, but basically 60 by 2 means that 60% of your players on average are going to, excuse me, two of your players on average are going to score 60% of the points for your team. Conversely, when you set up a defensive game plan, okay, on average, two players that the opponent has is going to score 60% of the points. Now, if that's true, all players can't take the same amount of shots. So who and you know your guys better than anybody. Who are the players that should be taking shots? Now, what kind of shot? You can have a kid on the gun. You got to be really, really careful, guys. You can have a kid on the gun this summer, and it's just making 80, 85, 90 out of 100 on the gun. And because of that, he's considered a great shooter. You know, he's the best shooter in our program. But possibly the only shot that he is proficient at making, statistically, is a three-point shot. Let's say he's thin, he's not very tough, he gets in the lane, he coughs it up, he can't finish, has no mid-range game. So be really careful about who you're saying is a great shooter. Okay, so what kind of shot factors into this? Where from on the floor? Now, the kind of shot, let's back up a second, it could be a layup, a, a, a strong power finish, a floater, uh, a pull-up, a three off the break. There's a lot of kinds of shots. That factors in. And then from where, some players are better from certain uh, places on the floor than others. You know, some coaches think the corner three is a really, really good shot. Others feel like it's a pretty low percentage shot. So where those shots are taken factors in. And then how many? So if we've determined which player or players need to be taking shots to give our team the best chance to win, what kind of shot, what variety of shot, and from where on the floor, and then how many? If your best player is only getting a couple shots a half, it's like you're not even trying to win. And you can say players are out there taking the shots, not me. But I'm going to talk about how practice habits can prevent that. All right. So we've set the table with that. <clears throat> now I'm going to give you a sales scenario. <clears throat> I really think that we make too big of a deal out of parents. And the reason I say that, coaches, is because I, I don't think we educate them. Now, you're never going to please them all. But I think, we, I think you would do yourself a great favor by educating parents. To me, the best way to educate a parent is to educate the player. You know that you've got to figure it out when your players are going home and explaining to their parents why they're not playing as much as parents think they should. If you can do that, and if you can have those young uh, players using the terminology and the things that, that you stand for in your program as part of the conversation, you've got it made. And by educating the player, you can educate the parent. It's a pretty cool thing. Now, I want to talk to you about the sales scenario. 
I want you to use this because whether you have individual uh, player parent meetings, whether you have one big giant meeting with with players and parents or parents only, okay, you can use this. I have used this a bunch. And really, there's no way back and out of it. You actually have them in a corner if you do this right. Here's the scenario. Parents have a hard time dealing with two things, playing time and their kid taking shots. All right. We know that business is based on sales numbers. Right? If you're in any venture uh, that has to do with a good or service, okay, the, the value of your company, the health of your company has to do with sales. The more you sell, the better. All right. Salesmen vary in seniority, knowledge, experience, skills, and the art of closing the deal. Salesmen are rated 1 through 10 from best to worst, just like we rate our players. 1 to 15. Yeah, most impact on winning to least. It's the same in the world. This is the world we're talking about. Okay. And there's a huge account. In this scenario, you come upon the biggest account that your business has ever had. You have one shot, one meeting to close the deal. So, and you know where I'm going with this, right? Now, I'm talking to a parent as I'm given this scenario to educate. And I'm going to say, okay, parents, I know some of you are businessmen. Okay, a lot of you deal in sales, goods, and services probably. Who are you going to send out to make the most pivotal sale in the history of your company? Your number one guy or your worst guy, your number 10 guy? That's crazy, right? Obviously, it's going to be your number one guy. That makes sense. Have your best guy go and do the best job on the most important sales, uh, sales adventure. All right. So let's say you have 60, let's say you have 60 uh, appointments. And how will you distribute those 60 appointments, sales appointments, amongst your 10 guys in your sales force? Are you going to give everybody the same amount? Or are you going to go heavy with the guys that have knocked it out of the park for years for your company? And you know our big-time salesmen. All right, we know the answer to that one, right? Okay, coaches, the same goes for the 60 shots, let's say, that you have in a game. Let's say you take 60 shots. Your best shooters should take most of the shots and all of the important shots. End of a game, out of a timeout, end of a quarter, those types of things. Put it in these terms to parents because it, look at this last line. How many times have you heard this? They talk about what their son did as a freshman in one game where, you know, where he made seven threes in a row. Or they're talking about an AAU game three summers ago, and none of that crap matters at all. It doesn't matter. There's no way you can, you can fight this sales scenario. I think it is, it is absolutely necessary for you to use that and carve it, uh, it into, a, uh, you know, into a talk with your parents the way you want. Now, here's eight ideas for developing culture. Like I said, create roles. Overall roles and shooting roles. Take care of a lot of an issues. Teach team and individual players about good and bad shots. Educate them. Number three, boy, is this important. And if you've got to comb those hallways to get student managers, I would keep stats on everything. Over the long haul, you are going to build up proof, basically, of who's shooting and who's playing, just by keeping statistics. You know, you're at practice every single day. Parents aren't. They know what's in their head, and they know what their kids are telling them. So when you have those statistics, and I mean, I've heard of this happen so many times. A parent comes in, and, and the first thing is 
Uh, I want him to play more, but when he's in, he needs to be shooting the three because he's a good three-point shooter. Uh, I've heard this conversation. And you say, well, Dad, Mom, here's the deal. You know, we keep stats and practice because I believe that what happens on Friday night is dictated by what happens at 3.30 during the week. Okay, your son has taken 880 threes so far this season in our practices and workouts and individual shooting. He's shooting 11% from three. You know, and, and now I don't mean to demean your son, but honestly, if we're going to go out there and have our best chance to win, you know, we've got some guys shooting 40, 42, 45, 50%. Now, that might be hard to hear, but that is absolutely the truth, and we all know it. Number five, uh, number four, the importance of possessions. Are you teaching that to your team? Do they understand that? Five, design shooting drills to back it up. You know, your, your drills need to be as game-like as, as possible because everything you do in practice is going to carry over to the game. So if you're going to create this culture of shooting, your drills have to mirror okay, what you want done in the game. And again, let's talk about where on the floor the shot comes from, what type of shot. Okay, all those things factor into your shooting drills. Okay, to have everybody stand behind three and just jack shots is ridiculous. You know, it, it'd be like having all your players go to the 45-yard line and line up and everybody try to kick a field goal. You know, it'd be stupid. There's only one guy that can make it. Okay, he needs to be, that's why he's a field goal kicker and not the center. Now, I've always said football's got to figure it out. You know, and as basketball coaches, we really need to take a page out of that football because they got roles figured out. So, shot accountability in practice is huge because it carries over. Seven, what you allow in practice, you then give them license in games. There's no question about it. Whatever you've given me rope to do in practice, I am going to take liberty in games because you've allowed me to. And that's a lack of accountability and building culture on our part. And then your off-season workouts should also mirror this shooting culture. I hope that helps. Those are eight ideas that you can use uh, to create your own culture. Now, I want to share with you, second thing I want to do tonight is to share with you a, a three-man shooting drill with conditions. And I don't remember one coach in particular that taught this to me. I think it was a combination of uh, uh, being in a lot of camps and talking to a lot of coaches. And I think maybe it was, uh, maybe we put all this together at a, at a camp, at a summer camp one time. But I think it's the best shooting drill ever. And here's why I, I think that, because of the list of things that we get out of the drill. It's not just a shooting drill. Now, what's great is we trick kids all the time. We trick our players. We say, okay, now we're going to three-man shooting. <laughs> and I do it in the summer a lot. I, I work out a lot of college players in the summer, and I'll say, okay, three-man shooting. They think, well, good, a shooting drill. No, no, no. No, it's not a shooting drill. Okay, here's what you're going to do for your, your players in this drill. You're going to teach them mental uh, toughness in, in a mental and a physical manner. You're going to teach listening. And if these guys don't listen, they're absolutely going to, going to mess up the drill. And, and you're going to see in our video I'm going to play uh, how, how that happens. Because if there's a turnover, uh, then it's over. They're off the floor and the next team comes in. Communication, and then what's really important is relaying the message. Do your players relay the message? When I hear something, do I keep it to myself or do I tell my buddy? And that's huge in three-man shooting. We're going to cut, we're going to pass, we're going to catch, and we need those skills. We're going to use two hands on everything. We pass, catch, rebound, and grab loose balls with two hands. No exceptions. Players have to adjust on the fly in this drill, just like in a game. Uh, they have to encourage teammates because you can run into a situation where it's getting tough and you just can't get done what the conditions indicate that you have to get done. Uh, there's a feeling of accomplishment and winning. There's a, a tremendous uh, competition factor. And when I say conditions, here's what I mean. And this is really what makes the drill. This is why I love it so much. 
is a condition is uh, there's two ways to run this either by stationary or by rotation in other words if you're doing three-man shooting the same player in stationary rebounds he passes to the same player who passes to the shooter who shoots all right pretty standard now rotation is we move spots on every shot so if I shoot I rebound if I was a rebounder I become the passer if I was the passer I become the guy who cuts and shoots and then it starts to get interesting when you add movement to it uh, another condition is are we going to shoot twos or we're going to shoot threes or a combination of uh, a condition could be we change teammates at random what kind of shot how many shots in a row maybe we're shooting for a total you must call the name of the player that you're passing to so as you can see this is much more of a mental exercise than it is a, a shooting drill but I think you're really going to enjoy this. I'm going to show you a couple clips. And you get an idea of, uh, of what we're talking about here. Okay, hang on. All right. I'm going to add that one. We'll watch this one first.
Okay, so I wanted to just check, make sure everybody was was up with me uh, getting the, the audio and the uh, video fine. So that is an example. I'm working with a college team there. You saw the name Gary Garner earlier. He's one of my mentors, and he's the uh, one of the most fantastic coaches in the country. He's now the head coach. Uh, has been for a couple of years at Dakota State up in Madison, South Dakota, and that was his team. And you heard spacing. You heard about cutting. All right, these are all things that can be conditions. And when I show the next video, you you you'll probably hear of a you know of an of another condition or two. Um, and we've got some questions coming in, so so let me answer those before I move to the next one. Will you talk about a cut, uh, usually a pin down, or can you specify the type of cut? Well, without a question, you can specify. You know, it 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 might have to be uh, uh, a uh, curl cut. You know, it could be off a, pin, a regular pin down. You know, I may say they're spot up shots. I may also say, and this is a really good one. I may also say that the passes can't be, have got to be between 12 and 15 feet. If they're shorter than 12 or further than 15, it's a turnover. And you've got to cut hard to the ball to catch. What they'll do is they'll start 15, 16 feet away, and by the time they cut to the ball to catch, they're four feet away from the guy. So they need to get completely over to the other side of the floor, set their man up, and, and cut. And just add some variety to it. Uh, when you're uh, Coach Brandt, when you're doing the rotation, do you uh, do you rotate off of who makes the shot? Uh, for example, you said rotation. Their goal is two is to make two threes. Do they rotate rotate after each person makes their two threes, or rotate players each time? Well, love the question because you can do it either way. That's the beauty of this. Uh, typically, what I would do is is to give everybody a chance. We would rotate on every shot, uh, but you certainly could do it the other way that you suggested, dear. There, yeah, and have fun with it. And and as you can tell, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm digging it because if this drill is not the game, then I've never seen a game because everything that those guys are doing correctly and incorrectly. Okay, are going to show up in the game. This really isn't about shooting. Now, we're trying to make shots, and we're keeping track. Got to get two in a row and the whole thing. But there's way more to it than that. And I, I think you'll absolutely love it. In fact, going into, you know, now it being the off season and going into uh, summer, I think it would be a, a, ter a terrific time for you guys uh, to mess around with this drill and I can send you more information I'm gonna pull up another video here I, I can send you more video I mean I've got access to uh, I, I mean I've done hundreds and hundreds of hours of workouts with college players so I've got I've got plenty and I'm going to uh, yeah coach Brandt no question huge mental aspect to it uh, as you can see these guys kinda of put their heads down sometimes now I'm gonna show you another college team that I work with I have worked with quite a bit and it is uh, Dort College out of, uh, out of Iowa, and I uh, work, worked out with their kids quite a bit. So let's watch this video.
So there we go. Uh, Three-man shooting with conditions. Have some fun with this. I think your players will love it. There's a frustration level, as you can tell, a little bit. Now, I, I showed you a couple instances where it was pretty difficult when we had what I call a turnover. And, but believe me, I mean, I've got some flawless uh, tape on guys just doing an unbelievable job. And, boy, then it gets fun because they're thinking, they're moving, they're executing, and they're making shots. And, you know, one of the questions I get a lot about someone with limited practice time is we, we don't have time to shoot because we got to put in our offense and our press break and, and uh, try to get fundamentals in. I agree. And so combo drills, in fact, one of my other programs is, is competitive drills, but combo drills are awesome. And this is a combo drill because you can combine a lot of stuff into one and in a short amount of time really get a lot accomplished in a lot of different areas. So, uh, great. I wanted to share, definitely wanted to share three-man shooting with you. It's, I get the biggest kick out of, uh, out of doing that. with, And, and I'm uh, going to host a couple events this summer with college players. Really excited. And we'll do a, certainly uh, do this this summer, too. I want to talk about Steve Kerr. And uh, I wanted to keep this to, uh, t till the end. I want to kind of um, spend some time talking about Steve uh, in a couple ways. Uh, one, uh, for the kind of person he is, and number two, just the unbelievable shooter that he was. Steve is, and you saw my background, so I've been, out, I've been around an awful lot of good basketball players and a lot of good shooters. But I've been around two shooters in, in my career in over 30 years and 20 in college that when they shot, I absolutely would be ticked off if it didn't go in. Uh, one was Steve, and one was a phenomenal uh, shooter, became an excellent college basketball player, Jake Sullivan, uh, from the Minneapolis area who played for us at Iowa State. When Jake let one go, just like Steve, I absolutely knew they were going in. Boy, what a great feeling that is. Uh, at Arizona, now an interesting thing about Steve is he, was, he got injured in the World University Games uh, the, uh, the summer after his junior season. So he actually redshirted, a, a medical redshirt, and did not play the first year that the three-point shot came into college basketball. Now, you think that didn't tick him off, sitting on the bench knowing that line's out there. Well, he made up for it because in his senior year, he shot 57.3%. I think part of that may be because we didn't have – a defensive idea of how to guard the three because it just came in. I just remember coaches trying to figure out how to use it, how to defend it. But 57.3. He then played uh, an incredible 15-year career for the Bulls, San Antonio, Portland, Phoenix, the Magic, and Cleveland, and combined a total of 45.4% uh, in the NBA from the NBA line, which we know is way back there. He is the number one NBA all-time three-point percentage shooter. And I, I think that is a phenomenal accomplishment. And I'm going to share some, some uh, stats with you here. Uh, his Arizona stats, he took, uh, as you can see, only one one season. He got off 199 uh, in it in uh, the 87 88 season. Uh, that's the year they went to the Final Four, and uh, with Arizona. And those were the stats. Uh, those were the stats look like in college. Let's go to the NBA and show you some pretty neat stuff too. So these are the guys. This is the top 11. And being, being an Iowa guy, I had to uh, include, I was excited to include the last two guys because B.J. Armstrong played at the University of Iowa, and Kyle Korver is from Pella, Iowa. We all know about Kyle Korver uh, shooting the lights out in the NBA for many years. Uh, Steve, uh, number one at 45.4, and you recognize certainly a bunch of those other names. Now, there are 
players that have made a lot more threes, but uh, you uh, you can see the proficiency of some of these guys. And uh, at the bottom are his are his stats. In the NBA, he took uh, 1,599 threes. He made 726. Pretty incredible stuff. Now, we saw the stats. I have a video I want to show you. Uh, I put there at the bottom, next coach of the New York Knicks. I don't know. I'm, I'm checking the, the news like everybody else to see what happens. Apparently, the Warriors are courting him, too. Uh, interestingly enough, he's never coached a basketball game, but uh, if he coaches, I think he'll do uh, terrific. He's got a tremendous mentality and makeup, uh, I believe. So I, I want to show you a really, really special video uh, on Steve. Bear with me here. All right, that is my fault. I don't see it, but uh, the uh, the video. I'm disappointed because it's a tremendous video. It it has him on the bench with Jordan. This is '97 in Game Six. And uh, Jordan says, if they come double off me, which Stockton was doubling off Kerr uh, to go guard Jordan, Jordan's going to try to win the game on a last-second shot. He said, be ready. And Steve said, I'll be ready. And it's, it's incredible. But pull it up on, on, on YouTube later tonight and watch it. It's about a two-minute video. It's unbelievable. I get chills when I watch it. And sure enough, they inbounds it, and uh, Michael drives it. Here comes Stockton. He jumps in the air. And pitches it to his right, and Steve knocks down a 15-footer, and they win the world, uh, the world championship. And then he puts his own spin on it, uh, which, which is really, he's got a great sense of humor. He, you'll, you'll have to watch the part where he puts his own spin on it because it's really humorous. Uh, but I apologize for not, not having that ready. Um, this is what it actually looks like. This is a screenshot of it. And there's Michael and uh, Michael. Actually, if you watch a video, it's almost like he, he's afraid somebody's going to hear what he says. He kind of muffles it behind the cup, and Steve hears him, and then you'll hear clear, very clearly, Steve say, "I'll be there. I'll be ready." Uh, cool stuff. Here's what I learned from Steve: uh, that confidence was his best trait as a shooter, and. When you know you can make shots, you have to develop that mindset of being confident, even when they're not going. It, it, I think I think it's an, you can talk about all kinds of stuff like his awareness, uh, understanding the game, the fact that he, he was competitive. You know, all that stuff's great, but I thought his confidence was the thing that set him apart. Number two, he knew where the next shot was coming from. Just an unbelievable sense of the of the flow of the game, who's penetrating, what the defense is doing, uh, j just kind of what's going on. He, he just really had a sense for where that next shot was coming from and found himself in the right spot. This would be a nice list to show your players, too. You talk about the best shooter in the history of the NBA and, and, and say that these are his attributes and it might be neat for for your players to pick out a few of these and and try to pick up on them also. Anticipation and spacing, of course, when you're a, when you're a great shooter, you have to master that because, uh, because you're not going to get shots if you don't. He worked on, uh, that's just say, shooting at night. You know, we didn't do a lot of shooting drills. We did some, but didn't do a lot of drills in practice. And being a graduate assistant, uh, Tom Billiter, my buddy who's the head coach at Augustana in South Dakota, and I were graduate assistants, and we'd be at the library for study table, and after study table, uh, this is a great story, and you, your kids won't remember Kerr and Elliot, but 
but you, I mean, but you guys will. And so we'd come back to the uh, McHale Center uh, to do work at night, and Steve and Sean Elliott, who was a player of the year in, in uh, 1989 in college basketball, uh, would holler up at us to rebound. And so we'd go down to the floor, Tom and I, Sean Elliott would be on one end, and Steve would be on the other end. And I always kid and tell people that the easiest job in the world is rebounding for Steve Kerr. Because you literally just park yourself underneath the basket, catch it, and throw it out to him. And uh, uh, the other thing I learned from Steve is you better throw a crisp, direct pass, and it better be right in the hands or he's going to get pissed off. I learned that early. And uh, that was a part of his competitive perfection as part uh, of being a great shooter. And he would shoot and shoot and shoot. And it wasn't the number of shots as much as in the, at the end of his workout when he was dripping wet. And this is stuff that nobody saw, and, and a lot of players do things that nobody sees, great players. But uh, at the end, he would devise, uh, like he would say, I've got to make three in a row from these five spots. And he would make three, he would make three, he would make three. On the fourth spot, he might miss the second one. He would go all the way back to the beginning. He wouldn't stay at the fourth spot, make three, and then go to the fifth spot. Now, you talk about competitive, and you talk about perseverance, because here's a guy who's been a college student all day, and we've had a three-hour practice, and he's beat. He just wants to go back to the dorm and relax. And he's putting so much pressure on him to make shots. And it was incredible. I used to tell him, you should be a punter in the NFL, because I'll tell you, I have seen him punt balls in the upper deck of McHale Center like nobody, just rockets. Because he'd get, he'd get mad with himself, and he'd start punting balls, and then he'd kind of settle down, and he'd get back to his shooting. But he never just said, well, I'll make this last one, then I'll go home. It was always competitive. There was always something on the line. He always um, forced himself to be... Uh, to be exceptional before he would leave that gym. And, man, I'll tell you, it certainly paid off, didn't it? Uh, next, very competitive with himself, like I said. Found ways to help his team when he wasn't making shots. To me, that's a mark of a great shooter. And a lot of times, the best way to get out of a slump is not to continue shooting, but to bring value to your team you know, a couple of assists or maybe get to the foul line and next thing you know, you, you size up that next one and it's down. You know, interesting, if you go back and, or if you remember or go back and watch any video on him, he followed the ball with his eyes. And I remember that's one of the first things they said you should never do. Lock your eyes on the rim and follow through at the rim. Pick that spot out and follow through and shoot with your eyes locked on that target. And Steve, immediately, as soon as he released, he would look up at the ball and follow it into the basket. I thought that was always interesting. Certainly nobody on our staff, I'm sure nobody on any NBA staff either, uh, tried to retrain him because uh, you, you don't want to mess around with that. Always ready to shoot. You know, sometimes the ball gets skipped or it gets reversed. Players will catch it, but they're not really ready to shoot. I mean, they're thinking about it. They've got the intent, but they're not really ready. Feet, eyes, shoulders, everything. He was always ready to shoot. Uh, I love the fact that Steve Kerr commanded respect because of his work ethic, because of, of how, how badly he wanted to win. He was a tremendous leader. Uh, and again, that's why I think he's going to make, one of the reasons I think he's going to make an excellent coach. And, and number 10, uh, I think a, a, a leader can be defined by someone who's not afraid uh, to hurt feelings and is not in it for the popularity because uh, Steve Kerr 6'2", but, I mean, he was pretty sly to build. And I'll tell you, I've seen that guy in guys' faces that were three times as big, and I mean they were scared to death. That's how bad he wanted to win. And, uh, and uh, you know, Coach Olsen's got, got Steve Kerr on the floor. I mean, what an unbelievable leader and a coach on the floor. So, uh, that, that's just a, a, a list of things that I, I remember most about my experience with him. And uh, certainly I think those are, are, are really neat things to think about and maybe to apply to uh, a great shooter that you've known or as you develop shooters. 
uh, within your program. Okay, uh, guys, here's what I want to do. Um, this was really easy. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a poll up, uh, poll questions up on the screen. And if you would, just click on your answer as quick as possible, and I'll pull the next one up. This shouldn't take uh, more than about a minute, and we're going to roll through some questions. This will really, really help me uh, as I prepare to do more of this uh, for, for you guys. Uh, these are just questions. Enjoy and learn from the webinar. Okay, appreciate that. 21 votes. Obviously, this is for free. And, uh, you know, in my business, I'm always, I'm always looking for ways to bring value. And if I can bring value and at the same time um, uh, be able to support my business, you know, I, I certainly will do that. And just answer honestly, that's all I, that's all I ask. Okay, great, thanks. Next question. Awesome, everybody's voting, appreciate it. Okay, next one's on topics. Just be really curious what your what your guys' ideas would be in terms of topics you would like to see. Okay. Great. Uh, what, what I plan to bring, you know, like I said, is actually a series of presentations, so we're going to be able to hit on all those, which is good. It's just a little deal on, on the ease. I, I'm real comfortable doing these programs. I, I've done over 100 of them with my with coaches and my mentoring, and, and uh, I, I, I'm always curious to know if it's user-friendly, if, if you guys, uh, you know, can hear and and uh, the chat box is really good, and you know if the quality is good of the video, things like that. Thank you, 20 votes. That's awesome. That uh, that makes me feel good. And uh, a couple couple more quick questions. Yeah, this this is about the coach certification program. Once you're on the mailing list uh, of mine, you know, you can always unsubscribe, but as long as you are, you will receive the guy's information, uh, the best information I can possibly get you, and, and uh, I, I will definitely uh, do my best uh, in this program to, to give you guys what you need. It's not what I want to present, it's what you guys need. This question is just about recommending. I appreciate it. Thank you for that. Last question is going to be, uh, if you're on the program and not in my mentoring program, uh, but it's something that you would like to learn more about, I would love to, uh, love to hear from you. And then what I'll do in the chat box, uh, those of you that, that would like to learn more, uh, here's my email address. Uh, after the program, rb at Coach RB, please send me an email to follow up, and I will get you information on what our mentoring program is all about. We've got two levels. Um, yeah, we've got a coach. Uh, yeah, Coach Washington is uh, is in our fast track right now. So uh, that's our beginning program, fast track, and then uh, our elite mentoring uh, is is the next one. Okay, great. 
Well, thanks for doing that for me. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, that, that certainly helps a bunch. Uh, now, the next thing uh, that, that I want to do, let me put into the chat box. I've got some resources uh, that I uh, agreed to share with you guys. And uh, what I'll have to do is, is paste, uh, um, let's see. Okay, here's, here's, what, uh, here's what I would like you guys to do. Uh, if you go to this blog of mine, and let me double check, and what I did is I posted, I posted on my blog, guys, uh, about eight articles, and it'll be the eight most recent articles. There we go. Okay, bear with me. So it's Coach RB Basketball at Blogspot. And then what you'll see is a series of resources, and I'll just I'll just let you know what these are here. Uh, the difference between shot selection and shot distribution. Uh, I wrote a, an article on coaching Steve Kerr. Uh, Mike Dunlap wrote an article called "The Three Point Disaster: uh, The Secret of Kyle Corver's." Uh, record-setting shot, 10 characteristics of good and poor shooters, and, and a real neat shot evaluation by Mike Neighbors. Make sure you pull that one up uh, because that's kind of a point system that he uses to determine uh, who, who is the most proficient shooter. And then an article about uh, Fred Hoiberg, the best free throw shooter in college coaching. And he won a contest, and you can read about that. It's kind of it's kind of fun. Um, so uh, we went through the, uh, the, th the three items. If, if we recap here, guys, we um, talked about developing a shooting culture. Uh, showed you some video and talked about the three-man shooting, which I love. And then we wrapped up uh, dealing with, uh, with Steve Kerr. And we uh, answered a few poll questions and then shared those resources, uh, article resources, Coach RB Basketball at blogspot.com. Uh, just to let you know, previous programs that I've done, and I've also got these recorded, so if there's anything here um, you, would, you would like to see, uh, just contact me, and I should be able to send you a link for these. Uh, preparing for the Season webinar. I did one with uh, Layson Perkins on international set plays. He's tremendous. I did skill development with Rich uh, Walton, shooting with Paul Hoover, and I did a competitive drills with video uh, program. And again, uh, this program and all of my programs uh, are recorded. There are many more to come uh, on a regular basis, and as long as you're on my list, you will receive the announcement uh, on those. Uh, that has been an hour and four minutes. It has been an absolute uh, pleasure. Do you still have the GA webinar? Yes, we've got, boy, I've got tons of resources for you. Coach Brandt, if you could email me and remind me, I will send you, I, I will send you that. Yeah, thank you guys for your time. I, I had more information. We've actually got a coach in our mentoring program, Derek Olich, who's a, uh, a fantastic shooting instructor down in Phoenix, Arizona, and didn't have time to, to plug his stuff into the presentation. But 
Uh, you're welcome. I'm passionate about it. I love doing this. I love helping coaches. And any input you have on topics, on how we could do this better, on, on things you need, everybody's got my email address. Uh, I, I'm not sure there's anybody with a larger collection of basketball information uh, than what I've got. And I don't need to hang on to it. I need to get it to you guys. Uh, thanks from Australia. Hey, coach, thank you. Thanks for being on with that time difference. So, yeah, I could have presented Coach Carlson another hour too, but I think with playoff games on, and I think this was, was really good. I appreciate you being here. Please pass the word. Uh, I, I, I've never uh, advertised. I, you know, I've never done any of that. I, everything I do has been word of mouth. And I, I really rely on you guys to spread the word, uh, to have coaches sign up for the newsletter, uh, to attend these, these programs. Um, and, and we had coaches that didn't get in tonight. And I think I'm going to hear from some, uh, a, a couple of them that aren't very happy with me because they didn't, they didn't sign in quick enough. Because uh, as I said in the email, um, it, it, there, there are limited seats in these programs. So, uh, But with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Thanks so much for your comments. Uh, I will have this recording if you'd like to have the recording, even though you've seen it live. And anything I can do for you, uh, send me an email. Uh, would love to work with you and, and help you in your craft. It's, it's a great game. And, and uh, it, anything I can do for you to help you become a better basketball coach, uh, I'm all for it. So uh, thanks, uh, thanks, guys. Uh, appreciate it, guys and gals. And uh, have a great night. Enjoy the playoff games.